Well, that was a fun introduction, but I, I want to start things off by understanding where any success I've had in life come from, and it's from God. Where God guides, He provides. And uh, actually, after I won my first election, the press was asking, what was the secret to your success? Because I came from nowhere and surprised the heck out of them, and that's what I said. And I actually had to uh, answer that question three times, but he eventually printed it. So, um, <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about this. You saw from the background, the whole rocket scientist thing. That's a label other people put on me. It's not a label I put on myself. But, uh, you know, when people are talking about it, we'll talk about it as well here. And uh, I'm one of those kids that was always excited about space travel. I grew up in an era when we had Star Wars. How many of you guys were influenced by Star Wars and said that's a pretty cool thing to go off and do? That's what got me excited about space exploration. My favorite spacecraft of all time is still the Millennium Falcon, and I've got models sitting in my house that my wife can, I, can attest to. And I, I think that's something that in society today, we're kind of missing those big dreams nowadays. Don't you think? There's something missing, and we're gonna talk about that, why, why I think that's missing in this discussion. And that's kind of the theme of where I'd like to take us today in the discussion of what is leadership? And it's going to put it in a different context. We're going to talk about space travel and all that good engineering stuff. But then I'm going to drive, drive it over into a government context and talk about things that uh, we can really make a difference on, if not just having a leader, but having the right type of leadership. And uh, I think a leadership that I think most of the folks in this room can appreciate. So um, first and foremost, I'm an uh, uh, unapologetic Christian. That's what's driving me and the worldview and where I want to go in life. And, um, where God wants me to go, so I'll, I, uh, I just want to make sure that's clear up front, but I think there's a, it's important from a, um, a, a just a uh, worldly perspective as well when you actually look objectively about how we got to where we are as a country and uh, where we need to go going forward. So uh, without further ado, this was my baby for quite a few years. When I graduated from University of Michigan and then later at the International Space University, I went off and wanted to look at jobs and one of the jobs that I got was working on space station. Matter of fact, I was a co-op student with Lockheed Missiles and Space Company out in uh, California. And that was a great opportunity because to be honest with you, I, even when I went to University of Michigan, I had no idea what an aerospace engineer did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is, I'm the first aerospace engineer in the, in the family here. I mean, my dad's a computer scientist and my mom's an organist for church. Um, so this is kind of uncharted territory. We're boldly going where no one's gone before. <laughs> <laughs> and so out at Lockheed, I worked as a co-op student on Sunnyvale. And the projects that they assigned me to were working on automation in the, uh, in the uh, space station. So uh, in the life sciences mod module, we had a lot of uh, lab rats and lab animals and those they tend to leave deposits that have to get washed off and astronauts don't necessarily like to get their hands dirty <laughs> up in space so they gave it to the co-op student to figure out how to clean the cages um, and so we use robotics to go off and do that and design cage washers for that and that was my first initial assignment and and it got me introduced and I got even more excited working out there because uh, the stuff that we're working on was truly trailblazing and so many different fronts well, I came back, um, I was going to go back and continue that uh, rotation uh, with Lockheed, but uh, you guys remember the Challenger disaster in 1986. And I was supposed to be going back to, to uh, work on Space Station, but the whole program halted in the wake of that. And um, the, uh, um, so I went on to pursue other things and finished up, got my master's degree, and then eventually ISU, and then went to Boeing, and where I continued my work on Space Station. Um, this is a big endeavor. This turned into the, it's called the International Space Station. When Reagan renamed it Space Station Freedom, it created quite the uh, kerfuffle originally because he didn't ask anybody <laughs> what the name should be. He just said, no, we're going to call it Freedom. <laughs> and, um, but I, I like that. And I still got the old pins that still have Freedom on it. You won't hear most people talk about it in that context. But that's what it was all about, about bringing people together and appreciation for what freedom can bring to bear in, in the world. And my... Um, my little baby that I worked on towards the end of my um, stint with Boeing was this uh, something called the airlock module. It's called the Quest airlock module. This little compartment here about the size of a phone booth is where two astronauts sit in their spacesuits before they go outside into space. The reason this is smaller is because when you open up that hatch, you don't want a lot of air going outside. 
And, uh, and this over other area here is called the equipment lock. It may look a little bit tiny here relative to uh, what we're used to here on Earth, but remember, you can use the ceiling, you can use the side walls, you can use everything. There's a lot more space zooming around in, in space there. And here's a little panel. Here's something else that I worked on called the gas conditioning assembly, but it was an oxygen-nitrogen system, uh, essentially, that uh, maintained the atmosphere in the, in the space station. That was an extremely fun job. It was extremely challenging. I was a young, you know, uh, engineer that didn't know what I didn't know, frankly, at the time. Um, but we were excited, we were energetic, and uh, frankly, had a blast while we were there. Um, while I was there, I was doing 410 schedules uh, with Boeing, uh, because every other week, I would be coming back to see my good wife, Angie, here, who I met up at Michigan. And Angie uh, is, a, is a pediatrician, so while I was going off and boldly exploring the new frontiers of space, she was going off and, and uh, going through a residency uh, program for pediatrics. And, uh, um, and so we had this long distance relationship that we came back to uh, later on, um, but it allowed me to go off and explore here, and she was exploring uh, the, um, doing autopsies and fun things like that. So, um, uh, so this is extremely fun career, and what it represents is going into something that a lot of people, you know, not too long ago, I mean, before I started, this was in the 80s when I started getting involved in this, and 90s is when I was working for Boeing. Pretty exciting times going over into the Soviet Union at the time, in a time when they were going through major upheaval. Um, matter of fact, the American embassy would look across the river um, right at the Russian parliament. Many of you may recall uh, Boris Yeltsin standing up in front of a on top of a tank at the time and uh, getting, uh, and so we had a front row seat of what was going on there. I wasn't there at the time, but the people that we were working with did. And it was a very interesting time from a geopolitical perspective. And it was all, our front row seat was provided by getting involved and boldly going where no one's gone before. Um, went on later and uh, got to an appreciation for government when I uh, journeyed over to East Germany at the time. So remember how we had East and West Germany, they weren't unified. Well, I was there right during uni reunification in 1990 I was speaking at an International Astronautics Federation conference. Uh, by the way, if you want to know how geeky I really am, <laughs> here was the title of the paper that I was presenting on. And this is before I learned the value of marketing and uh, being pithy. <laughs> it was called The Determination of Artificial, uh, the, the Determination of the Optimal Configuration of Artificial Gravity Space Habitats Based Upon Coriolis Accelerations. <laughs> so, I try not to have that type of title on my lit running for any office, so, uh, but I'm a geek at heart, all right? I often say I have a spreadsheet and I'm not afraid to use it. Well, that's kind of where I come from. It's very geeky stuff. But at the IAF, I got an appreciation of the importance of freedom there because when I flew into East Germany, into Dresden's airport, there were MiG-21s lying in the tarmac. When I came into town, uh, there's a Soviet barracks sitting right in the middle of town. When our tram broke down at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. I got out and had to walk two hours to where the hotel was that I was staying. There was not a soul on the streets. There's a difference between living in a country that promotes freedom and one that does not. And it got me very passionate saying this is something that I do not want to go down that path where, where, where I saw out in the Soviet Union and out in East Germany. I don't want us to go down that path. And um, so it got me very proud to be an American. I can't tell you how many times I just kissed the ground when I, once I got back home after some of those trips because in the Soviet Union, we were using both sides of copier paper um, because they didn't have that. Toilet paper was a luxury. If you wanted to make good friends at the American Embassy, you brought M&Ms with you. <laughs> so it was, uh, they don't, we take a lot of stuff here for granted that we don't get elsewhere. So it's very valuable to go off and get that international perspective. But that's not what I want to talk about today. That kind of sets the stage for why I get so excited about some of these issues. But the, really what we want to talk about is what is a leader, right? And here's a definition we used when I was, uh, my wife and I participated in something called uh, Via de Cristo, which is a lay apostolic ministry developing leaders in Christ. It's saying pastors aren't the only ones who should be going off and making disciples of all nations. <laughs> it's supposed to be the, everybody in the church. And so... I gave a couple talks on leadership, and the key thing to understand is that um, leadership, 
is a pretty important role, right? We're influencing the decisions of others. We're influencing the attitudes and the opinions of others. You can do this whether or not you're sitting in a, a checkout line at Walmart, or you can, you can do this in your church. You can do it from a government office. But you can be a leader wherever you're planted. And I think these are generally agreed to aspects of what a, a leader does. So what are some of the natural traits of a good leader? All right, spirit of initiative. So all right, something needs to get done. I'll raise my hand. I'll go off and do it. Kind of like Isaiah. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> Send me in there. Uh, the ability to risk. So um, when Angie and I ran for office, uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's a big of a risk. Um, I had zero political experience that we talked about, right? I shut down my business for nine months. Uh, we're not wealthy. Uh, we actually, actually had to liquidate all of our retirement savings in order to pay for the campaign and actually um, you know, pay our bills at home until we got uh, our first paycheck in Lansing. And a uh, little bit of a risk. Uh, and I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> so this is prime bread breading areas, but we felt called to do it. Which goes to the next one, which is that sense of responsibility. <laughs> we can either let our nation, let our state go to heck in a handbasket, or we can go off and do something about it. We felt responsible. Sense personal authenticity, generosity. We could all agree on these traits are good things, right? But you know, I can make a case that this guy here had all those different characteristics, right? So it's not just about being a leader. It's not just being about an effective leader. There's something more that's important that, that differentiates what happens here in the United States in particular. It makes us truly exceptional. And that is we go beyond that. We actually have this foundation of faith. How many of you guys have ever seen the movie uh, Monumental? All right, Monumental talks about this little known monument sitting out near Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, how many of you guys have ever been in Plymouth, Massachusetts? So you probably saw the Mayflower and you saw Plymouth Rock. Did you know that there's something called the Matrix of Liberty sitting out in a suburb somewhere nearby? This Matrix of Liberty was put out um, about 100 years after our country was founded. And it was designed to serve as a reminder that if America ever loses its way, it would provide the foundational principles that would get us back on track. And um, this matrix at the center of it was faith. And so the whole idea of living your faith, central not just to a, a supernatural qualities of a leader, but essential to having good leadership in our nation, I believe. Next is hope. Okay, I'm going to go through couple things that we dealt with in the legislature that, you know, and frankly, running for office when you're going off and investing everything that you've got um, into the possibility that you may actually get elected into office, um, you know, there's a lot of hope that we're focused in on, hoping for a good outcome, because frankly, if we didn't win, there's very little chance to go off and recoup our losses in any way, shape, or form. Um, love, and this is something that we miss sometimes. We miss quite a bit. You can have very good, you can have policies um, out there that, uh, that may be good from an economic perspective. They may make financial sense. They may look good in the spreadsheets that I like to look at. But ultimately, if you're not doing it out of love, you're going to have some bad directions on those policies that in the long run are not going to be beneficial. Maybe sh you can get some short-term stuff without, without love. There's no doubt about it. But long-term, you know, there's an importance to go in and actually... Uh, look at uh, the best interests of others when you actually serve. What's the biggest frustration that we see right now in politics? We see a lot of politicians, elected officials that are serving themselves and not looking at um, the best interests of the people that put them into office. That's why messages such as Drain the Swamp resonated so well with people is because they're seeing people that are going up there that are padding their own pockets, they're serving their own self-interest, or simply they're simply tone deaf and instead of having people that are saying, no, I understand what you're going through. We're going to do something to go off and help you out. And, uh, and frankly, in business, it's the same thing. This is a central tenet of the free market system, right? If you're not looking out for the best interests of others, then you're not going to figure out what they need to go off and buy. And then humility. So, um, you know, when I was in football, we used to have a, a saying or a slogan that said, if it is to be, it is up to me. And boy, have I found that to be wrong. <laughs> um, now, I understand the incentive, I intend the intent of that, um, but ultimately, um, you know, just like I started off with in, in this, I, all the success that we've had as a couple 
um, I know where that success comes from. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, for me, it's just a matter of listening and getting nudged in the right direction and uh, sometimes kicked in the right direction. So have you ever, um, this gets into uh, an, another quality that I think we're going to delve into in just a bit, but uh, in one of my favorite uh, leaders here, it's Jesus. So while all these natural traits kind of led to some guy we probably don't want to follow too much, there's no, if you want to talk about the greatest leader of all time, the one that's changed the world more than anybody else in the whole world, and I'll put up anybody against that person, it's that guy sitting in the center of the photo there. And uh, I don't think we give him half so much, whether or not you believe that he's a son of God or not, you can't deny the impact he's had in changing this world. And, uh, and all those traits that you saw on that last slide, that's, what, that's the difference between the guy with the funny mustache and the Son of God. So, so why is this important? Well, we get to this heart of why is America different? Why is America different than East Germany? Why is America different than Soviet Union? Well, there's something very different here in, state, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in our country at its founding. A lot of people attribute American exceptionalism to some sort of arrogance, opposite of humility. That's not, it's an ex we are the exception, not the rule, because of our foundation. Our Constitution was meant only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly unsuited to the governance of any other. Because if you cannot govern yourself, guess what? A bunch of politicians get to go off and chase the headlines and go off and put in a law that says, oh, you can't do that anymore. Even if it's, you know, it's just affecting this one person over here has gotten out of control now, everybody else has to deal with that law as well. And you have this gradual erosion of this thing called freedom. And uh, for me, that's troubling. And, uh, I also, John Adams has one of my other favorite quotes. He goes, you know what the difference between a politician and a statesman is? A politician fears man, but a statesman fears God. We need more statesmen. So this has led to something that's very interesting uh, of late. And I've been right in the center of a lot of these discussions. How many of you guys heard that, you know, we've got two different divides here in, in politics. We've got social issues and we've got fiscal issues. And, you know, the Republican Party just needs to focus on the fiscal issues. Forget this social issue stuff here. That's just too contentious, too divisive. We shouldn't go into that. That's kind of the mindset that a lot of people have. And so, of course, on the moral issues, you know, we're not supposed to talk about abortion or LGBTQ policy or social justice, religious freedom, free speech. Those are off limits. And then economic issues, that's, that's okay. We can get out the spreadsheets. We can talk about financial figures. But I can tell you, I've worked, there was a proposal to put new social study standards here in the state of Michigan. And uh, I took a look at those standards, and I'm going, whoa. Uh, you know, this is a pretty one-sided worldview perspective on social studies. I said, this is unacceptable. And I said, because they were pushing all the moral issues. They're pushing it in our schools. But they're only pushing it from one perspective. So we're sitting there with one hand behind our back on this stuff, and I said, no, that's not going to work. And I got together with 17 of my other legislators, put together 15 different issues with the standards, and I said, this needs to get corrected. If you want to find out what those were, by the way, if you go to morninginmichigan.com and click on um, education, um, uh, the education menu, you'll be able to delve into what those were. Um, so I said, this is ridiculous. Well, to the State Board of Education's credit, they said, you know what? You're right, we'll go off and re-examine it. We're going to set up a focus group. And for two years, I participated in a focus group. Um, and I was outnumbered pretty much 20 to 1 from a worldview perspective on this. But I had two requirements. I said, it's got to be politically neutral, whatever we come up with, and it's got to be accurate. And I'm happy to say we got agreement on 15 out of 15 issues. There was one issue, though, that surfaced during the middle of that that I think is the heart of this culture war that we find ourselves in right now. And it dealt with a term called core democratic values. And I said, before I sign off on this, I want to know what you mean by this. I go, what are, what are the core values that you want to promote with our kids? And I said, first of all, core democratic values is not politically neutral. <laughs> but I'm not proposing we go core Republican <laughs> values either. I, I said, how about core American values? And we got agreement on that. But then we delved in a little bit deeper. And um, I, uh, we could not get agreement on that. And uh, simple things like, uh, I believe that if you're calling it a core value, it's something that's got to be associated with a social compact that we all have signed off on, like this, which pretty much limits us to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, right? 
I don't care what some Harvard law professor says is our core democratic values. I care about what we the people have said in a social compact that there are core values. So you get into some interesting discussions. I, I believe that one of our core values is that we are all created equal and down by our creator with certain unalienable rights, right? Well, they don't want to talk about down by our creator. They don't want to talk about the unalienable in rights, but the thing that was mostly concerned, you get into the definition of equality. So they said, yeah, we can put in equality as our core value. I go, no, 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 not equality, I created equal. Because if they go off and we just have equality as our core value, well, that's equality of outcomes. That takes us down the path of what happened in the Soviet Union. That takes us down to East Germany. I said, no, 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 it's got to be created equal. We couldn't get agreement on that. Um, so this is what we're up against. We did get agreement on a lot of the other issues, but this core democratic value, I think, is at the core of why we see this divide right now as Americans. Um, and. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people are trying to make it seem like the United States is just a collection of geographic boundaries. And the, f the truth of the matter is that we are called the United States of America because we believe in a common set of ideals that unites us. And I think we've lost appreciation for that. So when we talk about all this politics, and if you go through all my, video, uh, all my floor speeches and everything that I've done legislatively, there's a common theme of getting us back to an appreciation for what are these core values. So a lot of, let's delve into this topic a little bit more. Um, so let's go off and assume that we're only supposed to talk about economics, right? We're only supposed to talk about economic issues. How many of you guys have heard of somebody called Adam Smith, right? You've heard of it, how many of you guys read Wealth of Nations? All right, that's our free market tome, if you will, that kind of documents what we think about specialization of labor and all, all good things free market wise. So, there are some people that want us to just focus in on that book. How many of you guys ever heard of this book by Adam Smith? This preceded Wealth of Nations. We don't hear about that much. It's called Theory of Moral Sentiments. So the discussion of economic theory, the discussion of the free market, was actually preceded by a discussion of morality. That was his magnum opus, if you will. That's what he worked on longer than Wealth of Nations. The sad part is I got a, my, one of my uh, cousins, um, one of the nicest kids you've ever want to go, he went to my alma mater at University of Michigan studying economics and history. He had three reading assignments, or three or four reading assignments on Karl Marx and Communist Manifesto. He had zero reading assignments on Adam Smith. There's something wrong. Um, but this shows the importance of moral issues as a foundation and social issues as a foundation for economic issues. Now let's go to another area. How many of you guys have ever heard of somebody named Milton Friedman? <laughs> All right, I think I'm in the right place. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Milton Friedman had a great way of classifying all economic transactions into a first party, second party, third party transaction. In a first party transaction, I'm using my own money to buy something for myself. I'm concerned about cost, I'm concerned about quality, right? Second party transaction. I'm buying something for somebody else using my own money, right? So I'm concerned about cost again, but quality, eh, you know, there's a reason why we have this term called re-gifting. <laughs> uh, third party transaction is when uh, you use somebody else's money to buy something for somebody else, right? You don't really give a hoot about cost, and you don't care about quality. You know what the really sad part about this is, especially in context of that, that quote from John Adams? all government transactions are third-party transactions. All right, so you'll see with me and my service, I have a big focus on making sure we get as much first-party transaction back into the equation. So I do this on healthcare with something called direct primary care services. I do this on education, which is a, why I'm a big proponent of school choice. Um, and across the board, it's important for us to get directly engaged. And that's at the heart of the concept of limited government, right? So. This is a big government approach. We're doing everything for everybody, and, and look what it gets us. <laughs> um, here's the original uh, design specs for our country in engineering lingo, <laughs> and it's focused on having a limited government. Well, you know, there is a way for third-party transactions to act like first-party transactions. Anybody have an idea how you can do that? There's this magic little thing that you can go off and, and uh, magic principle that you can put into place that uh, helps convert it. Well, all right, that's, that's pretty good. 
But I'm actually going to kind of go back to something that somebody else a while back here said. Um, you guys remember when he said, love your neighbor as yourself? <laughs> well, gee, that looks like you could make this uh, third party transaction look like a first party transaction. That's at the heart of how we go off and get back into, or why it's so important, frankly, to inject the principle of morality back into our economic discussions. All right, so I have a key principle that I talk about on the campaign trail a lot, and that is that you cannot have sustained fiscal prosperity in the absence of a moral and religious society. You can get some quick burns. You can go off and throw money at problems. There's no doubt about it. But uh, what are our biggest runaway problems from an economic perspective or budget issue? It's a lot of it deals with the fact that we've got runaway government assistance programs. We've got folks, we just passed legislation yesterday that I voted for around work requirements around Medicaid that gets demagogued. And uh, it's only the folks that are able body. It's, it's, it's highlighting the fact that Medicaid is supposed to be a temporary waypoint to help you on to the path of being successful and sustaining life on your own. Uh, but some people have turned it into a career. And uh, so you don't do that if you realize that the money that and the benefits that you're receiving were due to the hard work and labor of somebody else. You have to have that appreciation. You have to take that personal sense of responsibility. And uh, that's why this is something that I think we've really lost an appreciation for in society and it's something we need to restore an appreciation for. And the benefits are stark. I mean, I've traveled around the world quite a bit. I mean, the idea of poverty in, in some countries is like that. People are really starving out there. In America, much different picture of poverty. There's something else that's special about America, and it kind of highlights the back to the rocket scientist theme a little bit. There's a reason why America is the one with six flags sitting up on the moon, and the other countries aren't. Because all those qualities that we were talking about around leadership, you know, we got the natural qualities, but it's the supernatural qualities that help you go the extra mile, that get you to the point where you can dream big and achieve big things. And I think right now at the heart of what's going on, we're kind of losing our appreciation for that. And you can see it in our state in particular. You know, in 1965, Detroit had the highest per capita income in the nation, not just in the state of Michigan, in the nation. And back in 2010, we were the only state in the nation to lose population. There's been a drift. What's gone on? What's gone wrong? A lot of it is that, that uh, moral part of the equation, that social part of the equation that we've lost an appreciation for. Something else we've lost an appreciation for, and I wrote about this pretty early in my Senate, and what do I mean by we need more footprints? We've kind of gotten complacent. Everybody's focused in on security. And uh, they focused in on the safe route. It's like every, they, there's some people that want us all to live in a uh, plastic bubble wrap our whole life. And I think we're called to do something much, much more than that. I mean, the whole idea that Angie and I ran for office with zero political experience, I mean, for us, that was a bit of a footprint, right? And getting out there and doing something that was uncomfortable for us. There's a lot of folks that are just focused in on comfort. We've been lulled into the idea that we're as good as we're ever going to be, and we should just focus in on um, making sure that safety and security is everything we want, uh, that we should be focusing on. And uh, I think it was Ben Franklin that said um, that those who are willing to give up liberty for the sake of security deserve neither. And uh, this freedom thing is very, very precious. I don't think we really have an appreciation for how precious it is and how it drives what makes us really exceptional as a nation. Um, it, is, uh, it is very special, and I don't want to lose an appreciation for that. So, let's talk about freedom in a more down-to-earth perspective. How many of you guys have heard of right to work? <laughs> this is a big deal. Um, a lot of people said this was impossible, so it was one of those footprints. People said it was impossible to go off and put somebody up on the moon. When I uh, got elected into the Michigan Senate, it was after campaigning in a very um, high concentration union uh, district. I mean, I had downriver. So all the plants, you know, that in southeast Michigan, pretty much all the folks that worked in those plants were in my district. And I was surprised when I was knocking doors first time I ran for office. And 
you start looking at the bumper stickers of the home, or on the vehicles and the homes that you're going to go into and in anticipation for what the questions might be. So I'm walking in Flat Rock and I see a bumper sticker, a UAW bumper sticker on an F-150 pickup truck and I go, I, I think I know what I'm going to be asked. <laughs> so I go up to the door and the guy's uh, first question was, um, what's your position on right to work? And I go, well, you know, I haven't studied it a heck of a lot, even though that I was a union member when I was uh, working at G&W Discount Drugs as a stock boy. I was a union member there. And I've been in the front office working for another company where I was on the um, overseeing union shop. And, but I'd never heard the term right to work. And I did a little investigation in it. And um, I go, well, right to work is just about freedom, right? It's about restoring freedom of assembly. Because you're forced into a union right now. And he goes, yeah. He goes, well, if it's about expanding freedom, I'm all for it. And he goes, okay, would you like to put up a yard sign on my, on my yard? And I, that's when it dawned on me. And I, since then, I've had friends that were in um, unions that were tired of the unions not focusing on those supernatural qualities of a leader. They were not looking out for the best interests of the people that they were serving, and they were actually getting a disservice. So it's only appropriate that they get to choose whether or not they're going to put their hard-earned work their, the dollars from their hard-earned work back to the union. Since that point in time, I understood that there was a big economic reason for going off and doing this. But, you know, here's another aspect of leadership that uh, associated with this whole concept of right to work. You know, pretty much to a man, everybody in my caucus, when we got elected, said that they were all for right to work. And it was one of our top priorities. Nobody took the lead. Nobody had that spirit initiative. Nobody wanted to go off and do it because they knew they'd get hammered if they went off and did that. So the guy who actually is in the only senator in our Republican caucus from Wayne County was the one who ended up leading it, um, which is a little bit different. Uh, so we found the economic benefit associated with it. We made the business case for it. And I can tell you, when you take those risks, when you do so in a spirit of doing what's best for the people that you're going off and serving, the uh, impacts can be significant. We passed right to work in 2012. Where does all the employment start going up? It didn't go up after we passed the senior pension tax. <laughs> it didn't go up and it went up despite things like Medicaid expansion and other things that were out. The triggering event for right to work, or of the for our employment growth and our economic comeback was the passage of right to work. And I'll just give you a quick reason why that's the case. You ever heard of a site selection consultant? Site selection consultant, if somebody goes in and says, hey, you want to set up a big manufacturing plant? I'm going to go off and evaluate what the best state is for you to go off and do it, or best region, whatever the case may be. 50% of the site selection consultants, if your state was not right to work, they were saying, bye-bye, we're, we're not even going to consider you. So we were losing 50% of our leads to come here. And that's not even addressing the fact that a lot of the companies that were here right now uh, were looking at going elsewhere because we were not right to work. So this is a big deal. It's actually, the, since the passage of this, it's opened the door for Boeing to consider doing uh, airplane, uh, aircraft assembly operations here in the state of Michigan. And we're still, we're working on that path. About three years ago, there was a serious plan we put together for Will Run Airport to set it up for Boeing to come on in. So it's opened up some amazing doors. What are some other things that we should be swinging for the fences on? Keep in mind, they told me this was impossible to go off and do. We actually got it done with what I call the Philippians 4-8 strategy, which is focus on what's noble, true, excellent, and praiseworthy. Usually when you take on contentious legislation, you'd play whack-a-mole. You find the people that are for you, and you find the people that are against you. The people that are against you, you keep whacking down. <laughs> and the people that are for you, you say, good job, you want to help us whack these guys down? <laughs> it's, a, it's a different approach. We did something completely different. We made the case and said, this is why we need to do it. And, uh, and that ultimately carried it across the finish line. Uh, so, what else can we go off and do for swinging for the fences? Yeah, favorite topic for everybody. So, how many of you guys have heard the topic, concept of an Overton window? Uh, anybody at Mackinac Center should be raising their hand, right? I, concept of an Overton window is, picture all the ideas that people think of as sane are right in this window right here, and anything that's insane is sitting outside somewhere over here. Um, on the subject of roads, the only things that were considered as sane were those that increased taxes <laughs> and increased fees. And I was this lone voice in the wind saying, no, guys, actually, we can fix the roads with the money we have right now if you focus on building higher quality roads. It was a long haul to get these guys to actually think that way. But I actually went off, and like I often say, I have a spreadsheet. I'm not afraid to use it. And I did it on, 
on the roads and found out, you know, if we focus on higher quality roads, you're not going to be rebuilding the roads as often and you're going to actually lower the overall title, the total life cycle costs of maintaining our roads and so your maintenance costs actually go down, not up if you do them the right way. And there are tons of technologies I can get into, but uh, ultimately this is a case where you, we have an opportunity to go off and do the right thing if we just get our focus back on the people that we're serving. You know, a little un, uh, an unknown secret about what happens when you get elected into office is that you go into an orientation session uh, immediately after and you parade, have a bunch of experts paraded before you. By the way, none of them are from Mackinac Center. Um, and the solution to every single problem that we face in state government um, is provided and it's every single one of them is a tax increase or a fee increase. <laughs> every single one. It's all about growing the size of government. And I kind of said, you got, what are you guys talking about here? There's two sides of a general ledger. There's this income <laughs> side and an expense side. Why do we only look at the income side? So I had to, my focus was on moving the concept of, you can look at the expense side, we can look at the quality of roads, move that into the Overton window, and that's what I've been pushing on. What else can we go off and look at that's kind of pushing the envelope just a little bit? What's another example of footprints that we could be pursuing as a state? How about eliminating the state personal income tax? That's impossible. We can't do that. It's going to leave a huge budget hole. We're going to hurt our schools. We're going to hurt public safety. No. That's the usual demagoguery that goes along with this. This is a case of starting to prioritize what's in the best interest of the people as opposed to the folks up in Lansing. All right. It's about a $9.7 billion hole, and including it in that hole is actually the graph that actually correlates to this. I don't know how that didn't transfer over here, but suffice it to say, we can eliminate the personal income tax with a, a series of milestone-based achievements. I'm not proposing going off and putting in a path to 0% on the income tax you put in one bill. I'm saying, guys, here's a set of objectives around health care, for example. Uh, Medicaid is our largest bu uh, budget item in the budget, about $18 billion. Um, if I can get a 20% reduction in the cost of delivering Medicaid services, that's $3.6 billion against this $9.7 billion hole that's left when you go off and do, um, you eliminate the state personal income tax. And we don't, by the way, if you're, you're uh, saving that money because people are getting better health care, you're not rationing their care. You're actually lowering the cost because you're focused on preventive care, you keep them out of the expensive hospital and catastrophic. If you keep on going, we've got this thing called the MEDC, um, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Essentially, they're a venture capitalist fund with your money. And uh, once again, it's a government transaction, so it's a third party transaction. They don't give a hoot whether or not it's working in your best interest or not. I mean, and uh, it's about a billion dollars every year that's spent picking winners and losers. Wouldn't it be nice to actually let you decide what's successful or not? I'm tired of picking the, the next uh, big widget, whether it's battery credits um, uh, or film credits or, uh, I, I want all those companies to thrive here in the state of Michigan but we gotta stop picking which ones we want to win and, and let everybody have an equal <coughs> opportunity. Um, and a bunch of other things that go in there. But I'm telling you, this is possible. We can swing from the fences on this stuff and we don't have to delegate ourselves to the pale pastels of like a 0.3% reduction. Here's a vision for Michigan government. We gotta couple these natural abilities of a leader into these supernatural abilities of a leader. That's what's gonna encourage you to do what's actually best for everybody in our state instead of what's best for the personal self-interest of whoever that leader is. This is the challenge before us. And uh, it's something I'm committed to doing, something my wife is committed on doing. And uh, it's, believe me, what we're doing right now, serving in government, is not my first choice of what I'd like to be doing with my life. I had a much better life before this, I must admit. I had a much better golf handicap before this. <laughs> Um, and uh, last night, just so you know, here's a day in the life. I uh, want to talk about longest drive championships. I mean, you know, if you get over 300 yards, it's a pretty good drive, right? Well, my drive yesterday was from Canton to Lansing to Saginaw to Ludington back to Canton. So I'll put up my longest drive against anybody here. And <laughs> um, so it's not comfortable. But you know what? Colossians 323 says it's not. I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing it for the Lord. And so you do everything that you do so that you're living your faith, you're living in hope, you're living in love for your fellow citizens, and uh, that's what it's all about. And I think, um, I appreciate every single one of you being here because each and every one of you is a leader. And I 
had just a casual conversation with a lot of the folks here beforehand, I know a lot of these attributes are coupled with these attributes and the people that are inside this room. Together, we get everybody rolling in the same direction on this. Michigan is going to be a center of gravity for something where everybody's going to be sitting there going, what is going on in Michigan? Why can't we be more like Michigan? Right now, everything is, why can't we be more like Texas, right? <laughs> now, we need to get back to the point where Michigan was the leader across this state. And it's not just about Michigan. It's not about just beating our chest saying Michigan's better than the rest. It's about changing our government as a whole. And when America is strong, the rest of the world is strong as well. So that's the challenge before each and every one of us today. And I think that ends the uh, leadership portion of the discussion here. <laughs> and uh, hopefully it was of, of some value or pique your curiosity or, or helped you look at leadership, maybe even government service in a little bit different way than you may have looked at it before. But here's the important stuff. Um, so uh, I was born and raised uh, at, um, in the Catholic Church. My mom's an organist, um, and she's passed away a few years back um, before we ever got into this political craziness. Um, always a person of faith, altar boy, whole nine yards. And um, when I went to high school, I went to Detroit Catholic Central. So here we are in Birmingham. And so if there's any Brother Rice fans, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Or De La Salle. Yeah, I injured my back against De La Salle. So I remember De La Salle very well <laughs> playing football. But um, I was very engaged in church. And I, I was blessed to be brought up in a uh, school where the theme was teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. And I really appreciate that. My, um, but I was never encouraged to go off and get inside the Bible at the time. And that's something that I really miss and something that since that point in time, I've really delved into quite a bit. My wife is a born and raised Lutheran. And, uh, and, but when we got married and moved down to Florida, we went to a Catholic church for quite a few years. Since then, we came back to Michigan, went to her Lutheran church. And then now we go to a non-denominational church called Northridge out in uh, in Plymouth that's Bible-based, and um, we really appreciate it. And so I, I always review to myself kind of as a, a review, a refer to myself as a Christian mutt. <laughs> uh, so if you want a little C Catholic, and uh, because it, it's all about Christ, right? Paul himself talks about that, you know, I don't want to be a Apollo follower. I don't want to be a, I forget the other guys he was referring to. I want to be a Christ follower. And that's ultimately what it's all about. And that's where we're coming from. Well, that, that discipleship started with my wife and I in that Via de Cristo we were talking about that formed the basis of these definitions for leadership. And I, uh, it's, it's a, I can't say that it's one of those cases where I had an immediate, everybody can go off and call when they came to Christ. Some people have that moment, and uh, I, I can probably make the case for it. When I went to that weekend, I definitely I felt like I was finally on the right track and where God wanted me to be. But uh, it's been a journey, all right? This is, you know, you don't, this is exercise. It, you, just like you don't get into good physical shape, like I'm not right now, um, without exercising, without making an investment, same thing happens in your faith life. You have to make an investment in it. And uh, every single morning I wake up, and even when I get in at 1.30 and have to wake up at 4, my first thing that I do is read the Bible <laughs> and get into my devotion. And uh, matter of fact, when we ran for office, um, it came on the heels of uh, going to this meeting with this guy that was going to be serving in the seat that I'm in, and I, I was, I was he, he lied to us during that meeting, and I said, I don't want anybody like that representing me up in Lansing. And so we went off and prayed. I gave God a deadline. <laughs> I, I learned to be very specific in prayers, by the way. <laughs> and uh, it was February 21st, and my devotion for that morning, because I was in the Bible all that time, was from 1 Corinthians 9.24, which reads, for many run the race, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. And so if you're wondering why we shut down my business for nine months, if you're wondering why I, we liquidated all of our retirement savings, that's why. We felt called to do it. And uh, you really want to test your faith. That's a good way of going off and doing it. And, uh, and since then, we've stayed in the Bible. And this is the most corrupting environment you could ever serve in when it comes to government. It really is. And if you don't have that firm foundation, you will be led astray. There's been plenty of very good people in government that have been led astray. They start off with the best intentions, but they go off the beaten trail. You have to stay focused on God. And the Bible is anew every single morning. It always has something good to, uh, 
for, to put into your life every single day. And I'm happy to say, and I want to give you all encouragement, we have Bible study every Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the House Office Building with anywhere from 20 to 30 legislators. We have a good crew coming up through the House now in particular that are focused on God. They're putting Christ at the center of their relationships with everybody. And it is encouraging to me. It feels like I'm not just a lone voice in the wind anymore. We have reinforcements. David's mighty men are out there and women. And it is very encouraging. And I want that to be an encouragement to each and every one of you as we go forward in this political environment. I don't know what God's got in store for you, but I'm telling you that each and every one of us has the ability to go off and shape things in a way that gets more footprints, that goes off and makes disciples of all the nations in the world and out of this world. And I hope I've given you some encouragement that this lowly engineer who just likes to play with spreadsheets all the time um, has been able to be at the center of uh, some major policy shifts in the state like making Michigan a right to work state. And I'm confident that it had nothing to do with me. It just had me saying, here I am, Lord. And so I hope everybody in this audience can make sure that they can go off and raise that hand when God's calling them to action as well. God bless you guys, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with each and every one of you. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission, of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10:9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you 
that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.